So now we will have uh, our first remote speaker. So this is a hybrid school, not just for the attendance, but also for the speakers. And there will be Matteo Gatti from uh, Ecole Polytechnique in uh, France, who is going to give you some more details uh, about uh, many body perturbation theory from equations from uh, spectroscopy. And so please, Matteo. Thank you, Davide. And good morning, everybody at ICTP. It's uh, nice to see so many friends uh, faces over there. And uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody that uh, are following online. I'm very sorry uh, that Lucia Running, who was supposed to give uh, this talk, had to cancel uh, her um, participation at the very last moment. I'm very sorry for her. And I'm also sorry for you because you have me instead of, of her. Um, the deal is that I will uh, uh, use her presentation. So I will uh, try to tell you what she had prepared for you. And um, so if you uh, have any questions or uh, any complaints, you can use uh, my email here. Um, so what I'm going to tell you is my responsibility. And if you have anything you want to, to, to ask uh, or complain, you can use my, my email here. So the idea of uh, Lucia's lecture was to make the bridge between what Pedro has just told you about May body perturbation theory and the equations of Green's functions theory and the applications and in particular about spectroscopy that you will start to uh, see it, um, starting from next next lecture. So the, the content of Pedro's lecture was uh, the discussion of the main body problem in quantum mechanics and the introduction of Green's functions with uh, uh, their properties and in particular the Dyson equation. And the last point of his lecture is uh, what was what came next after you have uh, introduce all these formulas, what comes next? And the answer uh, concerning uh, the point of view of this lecture is uh, theoretical spectroscopy, in the sense that uh, one of the uh, most widely used of uh, Green's functions theory is the calculation, is the prediction, and the analysis, and the understanding of spectra. And uh, excitation spectra are useful for many different applications. They can be uh, new materials for uh, uh, solar energy, so new solar cells, new uh, materials for uh, memory devices, new materials for new uh, colors for candies. So the applications of spectroscopies can be very, very different. And um, these functions are made for uh, calculation of electronic excitation spectra that are at the basis of spectroscopy. The first uh, question we should ask uh, whenever we uh, start to use uh, a theoretical formulas is why we do what we, we do. So this is the first question that I will try to address in the following. Why should we use Green's functions instead of, for instance, the main body, uh, main body wave function or the density? So what we are interested in when we um, want to do spectroscopy or in general, when we solve quantum mechanics problem, are observables. And we have learned from the basic quantum mechanics that if you are at a temperature zero and for a given number of particle n, uh, is that observables are expectation values uh, of some particular operators that are related to, to the specific observables. And expectation values are calculated as integrals with respect to uh, the main body wave function of the given operator. If the system has uh, n electrons, uh, the final answer is mm, maybe just a number. And uh, at the end, what we have to do is a very large integral with respect to uh, many of the degrees of freedom in uh, our system. So this is a very complicated object. But in principle, if you uh, know the minimum degree function, what is uh, here is just a recipe that is telling you that if you give me the mini body wave function, I can tell you which is the observable that you are interested in. You have just to perform this very complicated integral. But this is a functional that is, in principle, known. The only problem is that this is very complicated 
and you have to make a very large effort uh, to calculate and to store uh, this mini particle function, which in most cases of interest is impossible to do. And after all, after you have made this very huge effort, you are just interested in a number. So this is not a practical way to go. The alternative is density functional theory. And in density functional theory, we have learned that instead of calculating observables using functionals of the minimum function, we uh, replace these functionals with other functionals. Uh, these functionals could be in principle functionals of the external potential that defines uh, our system. And in density functional theory, the idea is to calculate observables as functionals that in principle are different from the original functionals. And these functionals are functionals of the ground state density. And Oenberg and Kohn has told us that uh, in principle, we can calculate uh, all the observables, um, not only the observables that can be explicitly calculated as uh, 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 observables in terms of, of the um, explicit observables in terms of these integrals uh, of the density, okay. so single particle operators. But, but we can calculate in principle any observable in, in, in as expectation value in the ground state uh, wave function for, uh, in principle, all the quantities that we are interested in. And this is. Uh, in terms of a function of, of the density, as I have just said. So uh, instead of using the mini body wave function as our descriptor of the system, which is what um, very often we do in quantum chemistry when we do um, simulation for small uh, molecules where the uh, number of degrees of freedom is limited. And this is uh, called um, configuration interaction uh, theory. Or in the in case of um, quantum Monte Carlo uh, calculations where we make a stochastic estimation of this wave function. Instead of using this as descriptor, in density functional, we use the density, which is a more compact object as our descriptor. And uh, density, density functional theory is telling us that we can calculate everything in principle as a function of the density. But the first question that we have to answer is, where do we get the input that we have to insert in this uh, function, which is, which is the density? And the answer given by Konishan is the, I, the genius idea to build an auxiliary system, which is the Konishan system, uh, that is just meant to give us the, the density that is, again, the input that we need to uh, put in our function to obtain uh, the observable. It's an auxiliary system because, as uh, we have uh, already discussed uh, previously, the conscious system is just meant to give us uh, the density, but, for instance, the eigenvalues of these conscious equations are not supposed to give us information about excitation energies. The only information that the conscious system is supposed to give us is the density. And we know that we have to solve this system of equations that are the Konsham equations, where we have the Hamiltonian that is an effective Hamiltonian, where in addition to the external potential that describes our system, we have the RT potential that is related to electrostatic uh, interactions, uh, so classical electrostatic des description of the system, plus a correction that is the exchange correlation potential of Konishan, that is a local potential, that is a function of uh, the density, that is formally defined as a functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy with respect to the density. And this is the quantity that we have to approximate. So uh, this is what Konishan gives us. It's the density. But the second problem of DFT is that for most of the cases, we don't know the functionals. So even if we have the density, we are not able to uh, express our quantity of interest as a function of the density. And the typical example is something that is, has to do with spectroscopy and excitation spectra. So this is what we are going to discuss in a moment. To, to summarize, the uh, exact conscious system is designed to give us the good density, it's often used to calculate uh, observables directly in the sense that uh, we use uh, the uh, functionals 
um, that were in principle supposed to be used in, uh, in terms of the mini body wave function, but we replace the mini body wave function with the consham uh, mini body wave function. And this is uh, an approximation clearly. And the problem is that uh, for most of the cases, we don't know the explicit function of the density. Okay, so the quantities of interest for us um, in principle are a function of the density, but we, know, we don't know them. And if we use instead the original function in terms of the minimum wave, wave function, but with the consham uh, wave function, then this is an approximation and it's not supposed to give us the good answer, okay? This is because the consham system is an auxiliary system that is meant just to give us the density. And the first example where we'll discuss this is uh, uh, photoemission uh, spectroscopy. In photoemission uh, spectroscopy, um, there is uh, some uh, uh, light that is used to kick out one electron from the system. So typically you measure the um, kinetic energy of the photoemitted electron. And you can also measure, if you do angular result photoemission, the uh, angle of the emitted uh, photoelectron. And if you combine this uh, information related to the kinetic energy of uh, the photoelectron and its direction, so its angle, that you can associate to the K point inside the material, uh, what you can obtain is uh, um, a collection of uh, dots that you see in, on the right panel. Um, and for instance, you can fix uh, a given a dot that corresponds to a pair of uh, energy, binding energy, and uh, K point that is associated to the uh, uh, kinetic energy and the angle of the uh, photometed electron. And then you can scan the angles and the energies. And what you obtain are these, uh, these dots here uh, that correspond to the band structure of the material. Okay, this is uh, what uh, photoemission spectroscopy is. And if you combine direct photoemission that measure the occupied states with inverse photoemission that measure the uh, inverse, uh, the, sorry, the unoccupied states, you can uh, retrieve the, the bus structure of, of a material. So this is the experimental definition of a bus structure. Now, in the independent particle picture, uh, what you would uh, you, um, obtain in the uh, description of this uh, experiment is just the fact that you think that you are removing one electron from the material and this electron was occupying uh, the single particle levels uh, at different K points if you are in, uh, in a solid. And so the description is just a collection of very sharp peaks Mathematically, these are delta functions at the energies that were occupied by the electron before uh, being emitted from, from the material. So this, again, is for direct photoemission, where you remove one electron from the system, you go from n to n minus 1. And this would be for uh, the unoccupied levels for inverse photoemission, where you add one electron to the system. Okay. So this is the independent particle picture, just a collection of delta peaks at the energies of the single particle levels. And um, this is also what Kosham uh, uh, DFT gives us. And uh, in particular, this is a comparison between uh, the LDA Kosham bus structure on the left and the experimental uh, uh, results in the, in the right. In the, center um, right panel. And um, you see that this is the band structure of bulk germanium. And um, in particular, you see here that uh, in LDA, you obtain a band structure that has uh, a problem, uh, in particular around the band gap, because uh, LDA is giving a metallic band structure. And uh, this is the famous or the infamous crucial band gap problem. It's the fact that typically, uh, in Consham LDA, you get an underestimation of the band gap. And this has two reasons. First is that we are using LDA, that is an approximation of the exact Consham uh, system. And second, and most importantly, it's the fact that the Consham system is an auxiliary system that, again, is meant to give us just the density, 
but it's not meant to give us uh, the, the band structure and also the band gap. And this is also the case in, uh, in if you have the exact exchange correlation potential. For instance, um, um, you can also think that you want to calculate the band structure of the homogeneous electron gas. So in this case, the LDA would be exact. Of course, the homogeneous electron gas is a metal, so there is no band gap, but you can still compare uh, the band structure with more advanced uh, theories like uh, Green's function theory. And you would see that even the exact consham uh, band structure, because LDA is exact, so it's known, is not equal to the exact band structure. So even if you have the exact consham uh, exchange correlation potential, you don't get um, the exact band structure of the material. In the case of the gas, uh, this can be proved uh, directly because you have the exact uh, approximation, uh, the exact, uh, sorry, exchange correlation uh, potential, and you can have very good approximation for the exchange correlation potential in materials, and you would obtain also in that case that the band structure is not equal. And the reason is that, again, I want to stress the fact that uh, we don't get the exact band structure because we don't know how to express, express the band structure uh, in terms of the function of the ground state density. So what we have to do is we have to change the descriptor. Again, uh, instead of using the minibody wave function and density or the density, we have to use a different descriptor. And in our case, the proper descriptor would be the uh, Green's functions. And Green's functions um, have been already introduced by uh, Pedro. This uh, are um, describing the propagation of additional particles in the system. And in particular, I will first of all discuss about the one body uh, Green's function and its link to spectroscopy. So this has been already uh, introduced and the um, one body Green's function is a function of two point in space and time and one frequency. And uh, it's uh, a function that can be expressed in uh, this way with this uh, uh, fraction uh, a representation that is called the Lehman representation. And in particular, for uh, what is interesting for us is the fact that this function as a function of frequency has poles that correspond to the zeros of the denominator. And these uh, poles correspond to the uh, addition and removal energies that we measure in photoemission spectroscopy. And these are those that uh, describe the band structure of the material. So the, we use and we define the Green's function indeed because uh, um, the poles of this function will be uh, the exact quantities that we are interested in, contrary to, to consham. And in particular, uh, a quantity that is of interest for us in, is the imaginary part of the Green's function. And this imaginary part of the Green's function is expressed in the reciprocal space. So you have just to take the free transform of this uh, quantity and you go to the reciprocal space, so in K space. And um, then you can see that you can express this uh, imaginary part of the Green's function using um, uh, the, uh, this expression here, where you have uh, um, peaks at the uh, additional removal energies that were the poles of the Green's function that are weighted by these amplitudes that are at the numerator of the, of the Green's function that are called the Lehman amplitude. And this quantity is uh, of interest for us because it's called the, the spectral function and it's the quantity that we can compare directly with uh, photoemission. And in this way, you see that we obtain quantities that we can compare with photoemission as a simple functionals of the Green's function. In particular, in this case, these are very simple linear functional of uh, the Green's function. You have just to take the imaginary part of the Green's function, the absolute value, and you obtain the spectrum. Now, uh, you have seen that uh, the consumption system is an auxiliary system where you have an effective potential that is meant uh, to give us uh, uh, the density. In the framework of uh, Green's function and the one body Green's function in particular, we have to generalize this idea of auxiliary system. And instead of having this local and uh, uh, real potential that is the exchange correlation potential, we introduce a more complicated 
potential, effective potential, it is called the self energy that takes into account all the exchange correlation effects beyond uh, the R3 description of the system, as in the case of the exchange correlation uh, potential of uh, uh, Kolchan. Uh, but it adds uh, more, more features because this uh, new um, effective potential is now non-local in space. So it acts as an integral operator with respect to uh, the uh, wave functions. And moreover, it's frequency dependent because the, the Green's function is describing a propagation in time. So it, it is non-local in time. And if you take the Fourier transform, it gives uh, us a frequency dependence. So the self-energy is not only an operator that is non-local in space, but is also non-local in time. And it means that all the uh, quantities become uh, frequency dependent, including the uh, wave functions, the effective wave functions that are called the quasi-particle wave functions and the, the energies. So this is just uh, uh, a new auxiliary system that is uh, meant to reproduce the single body, one body in Green's function, uh, so a more complicated object, and this means that this uh, more complicated object requires a more complicated uh, effective potential that is uh, a self energy. You have seen that uh, uh, the Green's function can be calculated as a solution of the Dyson equation, and uh, this Dyson equation is just the equivalent of this effective uh, uh, equation that I've just written here. And um, the solution of this Dyson equation can be formally obtained as inversion of, um, of these operators, where you have the self energy and a single particle non interrupting uh, this function that you can easily express in terms of uh, the uh, single particle uh, energies that are the non interrupting energies. So, this is a quantity that we are readily able to, to obtain, to calculate, and the self energy in is uh, introducing all the effects related to exchange and correlation. And uh, from, from the imaginary part of the Green's function, we can calculate the spectral function. So formally, this is the expression that is uh, uh, explicitly written in terms of the real and imaginary part of the self-energy. The self-energy is a complex uh, object uh, contrary to the consham uh, potential that is real, uh, the self energy as a real and imaginary part. So both contribute to the imaginary part of the Green's function and to the uh, spectral function. And uh, the description of the uh, spectral function in terms of uh, this more complicated object is much richer than in the case of uh, the non interacting picture. So, uh, in addition to these uh, 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 single particle levels, you have other features that are described by the contribution coming from exchange and correlation that is encoded in the uh, self energy. And in particular, the real part of the self energy is uh, renormalizing <clears throat> the energy of the peaks. So it's moving the position of, of the peaks and um, uh, the imaginary part of the uh, self energy is uh, inducing a broadening of these peaks. So uh, each of them is moved and broad and broadened. And um, the uh, imaginary part of the self energy is also adding new feature in the spectral function. So all in all, you, instead of having a single peak uh, that is very sharp, you have a peak that is more broad uh, which is still a prominent peak very often. And this uh, prominent peak that, is, uh, that has a different energy and it is a different broadening, it's called a quasi-particle peak. It's the dominant contribution in the spectral function. This is what def still defines the uh, band structure in an interacting picture. But in addition to this, you also have other features that are called side bands or satellites that are a pure effect of uh, exchange correlation. This has uh, something to do with the fact that when you um, remove one electron from the system, you are creating a positive charge in, in the material. And this positive charge is uh, perturbing the system and it can create additional excitation in, in the material. And you see these additional excitations as satellites. For instance, this additional positive charge can induce 
um, the collective excitation of the charge that are called plasmons in the material. And you see these uh, additional excitations as uh, additional features in the uh, spectral function. And these would be uh, uh, plasmon satellites. So these satellites are due to the coupling of the hole of the positive charge in the material and additional neutral excitation that has been created by the fact that this positive charge is a perturbation in, in the electronic system. Again, this is a pure effect of correlation and, and it cannot be uh, captured in a single particle picture. So the um, description in terms of Green's function requires a more complicated object because it has to describe a richer physics, which is related to normalization, related to broadening uh, of the peaks, and to the creation of these additional satellites. Now, this, all this is in principle exact, uh, for the one body uh, Green's function. And uh, in the case of the one body Green's function in this uh, more complicated auxiliary system, we have the same problem as in the Consham system. We need to make approximations for this uh, self energy, this effective potential. The advantage of the Green's function framework is that we can define effective particles, uh, for instance, we can, effect, uh, we can define effective uh, uh, quasi-particles, and we can have an intuition of the physics that we want to describe. Uh, instead, uh, DFT is a, a many-body theory of a collective variables, which is a collective variable, which is uh, the density. In DFT, uh, we have consham electrons, but no one has ever met a consham electron. So it's not something that we can measure. We cannot use the, our intuition about the physics. This is something instead that we can exploit in terms of uh, Green's functions. Um, there are different ways to approximate uh, this self-energy. One way of approximating the self-energy um, is uh, um, very similar to LDA. And it's uh, um, developed in the framework of dynamical mean field theory where we express the uh, self-energy as a function of the local Green's function, where local means that we just take um, a particular um, uh, part of the Green's function in a particular space, in, in particular in the orbital space. And we are interested just in this uh, reduced part of the Green's function. And we express, um, uh, we make an approximation of the self-energy as a function of just uh, this, um, um, reduce uh, uh, Green's function, but this is not what we typically do in many body perturbation theory and in uh, what you will discuss in the rest of, of the uh, school. Instead, what we do in many body perturbation theory, we just follow the propagation of this additional particle that is uh, the, um, what the Green's function describes. And you have already seen that you can uh, follow these different uh, stories that have to do with the effects that are related to the propagation of this additional particle, uh, design drawing uh, fine diagrams. So whenever you have an arrow, this corresponds to the propagation of one additional electron in, this, in the system. And then you can think about uh, what this is uh, causing on the rest of, of the system. Um, and this can be expressed in terms of interactions. So you have uh, the Coulomb interaction that is represented by the dash line. And you can think that this additional uh, particle is scattering with uh, the uh, density inside the material. And this density in the language of Feynman diagrams is represented by a, a circle like this. So this corresponds to the R3 uh, potential, the R3 uh, term in the Hamiltonian. It's the scattering of the uh, uh, additional particle with the, uh, with the density. You can have exchange diagram uh, like this one that corresponds to the Fock exchange in Arthur Fock. And you have more interesting diagrams where you have more interaction lines. And in particular, we'll be interested in this kind of uh, um, uh, diagram well, the additional particle in the system is polarizing the medium 
And this polarization is represented here by this ring diagram, also called a bubble diagram, where you have the propagation of one other particle and the propagation of a particle with the reverse uh, sign, because the error in this way has a reverse sign. And this is corresponding to the propagation of one hole. So you see that you can understand this diagram as the fact that this additional particle in the system is creating an additional electron hole in uh, pair in the, in the system. And this is uh, associated with the polarization of the material that is uh, related to the fact is the consequence of the Coulomb interaction and it's a consequence of, of the fact that the system, the medium, is seeing the, uh, the presence of an additional particle in the material. And these polarization diagrams are um, those that are creating a screening, uh, a reaction of uh, the material for the presence of this additional particle. And uh, all this um, is something that we have to, to take into account. And this uh, effects are all encoded in the self-energy, okay? So the self-energy is just a collection of all these possible stories that are uh, that we have to keep track and are a consequence of the fact that we, are, that we have an additional particle in the material. And uh, uh, the spirit of making approximations in the Green's function uh, functional theory framework is just that we have to uh, select the most important stories the most important physical effects that we have to take into account. And in the uh, physics of the GW approximation, in particular, we take into account uh, in the self-energy, the exchange effects, plus these uh, polarization effects, these screening effects. And the GW approximation is called GW because the self-energy turns out to be the product of the one bar degrees function and the screen Coulomb interaction W. And the screen Coulomb interaction W is uh, screened by the inverse dielectric function. And instead of having this uh, uh, bare Coulomb interaction V, you have this screen Coulomb interaction W, and the difference is given by this inverse dielectric function. That is describing screening. And this screening is related to this polarization, this creation of additional electron pairs in the material. So the GW approximation is describing the coupling of the additional electron or the additional hole with electron pairs in the material that are screening the propagation of this additional uh, particle in the material. So, so Matteo, you can sorry. understand. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, we are reaching the question time. So if you, you have time for a few more okay. questions. Okay, thank you. So the GW approximation can be understood as the uh, propagation of uh, uh, a boat uh, on a surface or on the sea, on the lake. And this propagation of this uh, boat is creating waves. And these waves are those that are uh, describing this uh, polarization. And this is in contrast to artery fog. And artery fog can be understood as ice skating so you skate on ice and the ice is not reacting. So it's completely frozen. It's not able to uh, polarize, to react for this uh, uh, perturbation. So in GW, you take into account these additional uh, waves in, uh, in the uh, propagation. And uh, GW is today the standard approximation to calculate uh, band structure. And it's in very good agreement uh, with experiments. So these lines were calculated in the GW approximation by Rolfing and Lewy. And it's also um, correcting the artery fog overestimation of the band gap. Now, um, GW is not only uh, able to uh, calculate, uh, to give us uh, the band structures, but is also able to um, go beyond this quasi-particle description, and it's also able to give us uh, satellites. And uh, this is related to the fact that we can also calculate uh, this frequency-dependent object that is the self-energy. And here it's an example, and then I will conclude uh, uh, with this. It's the photomission uh, experiment of bulk aluminum in the middle panel. And uh, this is compared the calculation of the uh, spectral function on the left that is uh, calculated in uh, GW plus uh, cumulant. Cumulant is just a vertex correction to the GW approximation. 
but let's say it's, this is a, a calculation of the spectral function. And you see that the main feature is uh, this one that corresponds to the, the band structure of uh, aluminum. So you have just a parabolic band. And in addition to this, you have replicas that are here that are uh, uh, satellites. And if you measure the distance between the, the band and the satellites, these uh, are equal to the plasma energy of aluminum. So we can understand them as uh, uh, plasma satellites. And uh, you see that uh, this uh, GW plus cumulant uh, uh, calculation for the uh, spectral function is able to capture the physics, but it's not in a, a quantitative agreement with the experiment. Um, if you uh, want to be in quantitative agreement with the experiment, you have to take into account uh, all the uh, phenomena that are related to the photoemission uh, experiment itself. And uh, if you do so, then you can get a, a good agreement, quantitative agreement with the experiment. This is what we have done in this right panel. And um, this photoemission uh, uh, spectroscopy will be the subject of the next lecture by Polina. So you, you will get more details about this in the following. I will skip uh, the discussion about uh, uh, excitons, but I'm sure you will have uh, the occasion to discuss uh, about exciton in the rest of the week. And I will just go to the conclusion. And the conclusions are the fact that uh, we use Green's functions because uh, uh, observables we are interested in, in spectroscopies. Uh, the different spectroscopies are linear functionals of the Green's function. So these are non-functional of the Green's function. If you calculate the Green's function, you can obtain direct the spectra. And perturbation theory, gives us a, a very powerful way to de uh, devise approximations because it's related to an intuitive picture of propagation of additional particles in the system, in the electronic system, something we cannot do in uh, Conchon. And in, uh, in particular, I discuss the use of the one body Green's function for electron addition and removal energy. And you will see in the following that you can use the two body Green's function for the calculation of electronic excitations associated to absorption and uh, other spectroscopies that are uh, measuring neutral excitations like electron energy loss spectroscopy and elastic X-ray uh, uh, X-ray scattering spectroscopy. And the frequency dependence of the self energy and other kernels brings us information that is beyond uh, the quasi-particle picture. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention if you want to know more information on, on our activities, in particular on what uh, Lucia is doing, you can look at the website. Uh, Lucia has also prepared an online um, um, Coursera uh, uh, mock on uh, density functional theory. This is the address. And there is also uh, a book written by Lucia on uh, many body perturbation theory on Green's functions and quantum Monte Carlo. And this is this is the book. And with this, I would like to thank you for uh, your attention and I wish you fun with these functions and the rest of the school. So thank you very much, Matteo. And uh, the session is open for questions, if you have any. Or maybe, Matteo, I can start with one. So of course, in your group, you have, uh, I would say, the the most expert group on uh, satellites and uh, you have shown this last example where uh, there is this plasma satellite uh, in the photo emission spectrum of uh, bulk aluminum and uh, as far as i understand you can have uh, a plasma satellite because of correlation effects what you have described but you can also have some kind of plasma satellite because of all the effects which we do not account the fact that uh, we compute the spectral function but that uh, but then the electron is going out and uh, exciting possibly other excitations. So can you comment on that? Is, it, is there a way to, dis, uh, to disentangle uh, when a satellite is correlation driven uh, and when it's not? Yeah, okay. So first of all, we are not the most uh, expert group on this, but we are one of, of the groups, groups working on, on this aspect. And the reason is that uh, satellites are a qualitative feature of correlation. So if there is no uh, correlation, you don't have satellites. So this is interesting per se, because it's really a fingerprint of correlation. Uh, 
Yes. Then to answer your question, yes. Um, so in a calculation that is uh, just a calculation uh, of the spectral function, um, there is no photon energy dependence. So the spectral function doesn't depend on the photon energy. Instead, uh, um, experimental uh, spectra do depend on the photon energy. And um, there is always a contribution of the outgoing uh, photometed electron. And this outgoing photometed electron can also scatter on the way out from, from the material, and it can also induce uh, plasma satellites as the hole that is left uh, behind. And then there is also an interference effect between these two uh, uh, effects. So all this uh, contribute to uh, plasma satellites, and not only. And this is uh, photon energy dependent. So this is the step um, that we have to take into account when we go from panel A on the left to panel C on, on the right. And uh, this is very important if you want to reach quantitative agreement with the experiment, indeed. And very often we discuss about uh, strong correlation effects, um, so corrections uh, to correlation because we uh, find defici deficiencies in our description of uh, photoemission spectra. But often I have to say that most uh, important effects come from the fact that we are not calculating directly what is measured. What is measured is the photoemission spectrum. And if we calculate the spectral function, this is not uh, exactly the same thing. So there is a gap between the spectral function and the photoemission experiment. And indeed we have put a lot of effort to go beyond this uh, uh, spectral function description for photoemission. It's very important to try to work together with the experimentalists to bridge this, this kind of gap. Okay, so I hope Matteo, this so is now clear. Maybe we can start with the questions online. Yeah, Andrea. Mukesh Singh, Mukesh Singh, maybe he can do the question himself. No? Okay, so can you try to unmute yourself? As the name is uh, Mukesh Singh, if I spell it correctly. Okay, maybe we can read the question. So the question is, sir, how do we know that how, would, how do we know what term should one use for the calculating self energy? I guess that you are referring to this. It's uh, so in principle, the self energy is describing all the exchange correlation effects uh, in the electronic system. So if you have it, you have the exact answer for the one body Green's function. So you calculate it exactly. In practice, we have to make approximations, and the approximations are related to the physics that you need to describe. And um, the advantage of uh, Green's function theory is that you can keep track of the physics because you have these effective particles that are uh, interacting in the material. And you have to, as always in life, you have to make a choice. And the choice is related to the most important physics of your uh, uh, material. And in the case of the GW approximation, it's a specific case. We uh, make the choice of saying, uh, of identifying uh, the most important physical aspect that is screening. It is this polarization of the system for this propagation of this additional uh, uh, particle in the material. It's not the, the, the only choice. There are different choices that can be made. Uh, in particular, in the Green's function uh, formalism, we can as, uh, associate approximations with couplings. In the case of the GW approximation, we describe this uh, screening physics in terms of couplings between uh, quasi-particle and uh, neutral uh, excitation of the charge, so electron pairs associated to the charge. And for instance, we completely miss the coupling with spin excitations which are the other kind of bones. And uh, so if you, your material, your system of interest uh, has this specificity that this coupling is important, you should choose other diagrams. 
for the choices related to the physics. Thank you, Matteo. And uh, I have another question from a student online. So it's uh, actually a double question. So the first one is, uh, what does it mean to speak about non-locality in time? And then the second question is, uh, why the name self-energy? So why, why do we call it self-energy? Non-locality in time, it's uh, due to the fact, if we can understand it from the fact that the Green's function um, is the propagation of a particle from a time t to a time t prime. Okay, so this is uh, uh, giving us already one reason why we have no locality in time. Uh, the second reason indeed is uh, uh, more subtle uh, in the sense that the many body Hamiltonian is static. In our case, it's not uh, time dependent. So we have a static problem. And when we introduce the uh, self energy, we make a choice, which is we want to uh, Mm, avoid to uh, take into account explicitly all the many body possible excitations in the, in the system that are two particle, three particle, four particle excitations. And we fold all these uh, many body excitations in a frequency dependent effective potential that is the, the self energy. And this is like a, an embedding strategy. Okay. And indeed, self energy. <clears throat> It's uh, uh, called in this way because it's uh, um, a way to describe the effect of the other excitation on the particle itself. So this is one of the reasons why it was uh, called self-energy. Okay, so I think we have time for one last question, if there is any from the audience here, otherwise we can pick up. Oh. Uh, hello, sir. Am I audible? Hello. Uh, hello. So my second question was that let's say uh, if we put the self energy in quantum equation, will it improve the results? Will improve? Sorry. Will uh, improve the result? Maybe energy and band structure. Okay. Um, again, it depends on what you are interested in. If you are interested in the density, the Consham system is enough because the Consham system is meant to give us the density. If you are interested in the band structure, uh, you cannot use the Consham system because the Consham system is an auxiliary system. So it's a system of effective particles that are auxiliary particles that are just meant to give us the density. And uh, you have to introduce a different framework, and in particular, the Green's function framework, where you have this effective, uh, more complicated object, that is the self energy, with this effective, uh, more uh, complicated uh, auxiliary system, is meant to give us, um, for instance, the band structure. Then the quality of the results of this uh, uh, more complicated framework depends on the quality of the approximation for this exchange correlation uh, uh, self energy. So if you make a good approximation for the self energy, you get good results. Uh, if you make a bad approximation, you still get bad results. Uh, okay, sir, okay, okay, thank you. So one more thing, maybe follow up question. Is there any other thing apart from the density of a state uh, which, is, which can be calculated from quantum equation exactly? Not the density of states, the density. Uh, yes, yes, sorry, density. Okay. Apart in, from that. in principle, you could calculate from the density and DFT, you know that in principle, you could calculate all the observables as functionals uh, of the density. Okay, this is what DFT tells us. The uh, yes, but we don't know the operator you told. The, the problem is that for most of the, uh, the cases we are interested in, we don't know this uh, um, functional, okay? So in some cases, we have good approximations to the functional. In particular, for the total energy, we know that we can have good approximation to, to this functional, which is also implicitly unknown, but we have good approximations. The LDA, the PBE, these are the widely uh, used functionals. So for the total energy, we can obtain um, good estimates. 
for uh, quantities that are related to spectroscopy, this is uh, much more difficult. So in particular for band structures, we don't have these functionals. So we don't have sir, it. Okay, so sir, maybe- uh, how we, do we sorry. know that the- We, we move to the last okay, question sir. from a, a, a person here in presence, and then we have to, to move to, mm -hmm. the, to the next talk. So you, you can put the question on the chat and we will try to address it, okay? Sorry. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, so so how do you build this Green's function? So if uh, uh, from the equation you are showing, I mean, we basically uh, compute this from the Kohn-Sham eigenstates. Uh, but like, uh, so when computing this uh, uh, self-energy, uh, we do some Dyson expansion. So we have like, a, 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 for example, higher order Green's function terms. Uh, when we do this expansion. So how do you compute these things? Because this is like an independent particle level at, at an independent particle level, but somehow you have to include some uh, uh, interactions between uh, uh, these things. Uh, for example, uh, if you're computing the dielectric tensor, for example, in, in the, uh, when you're doing this thing, uh, we have to compute the dielectric tensor. So. Uh, the imaginary part of the dielectric tensor is somehow related to the, uh, we have to consider the interaction between the electron and the hole. So how important uh, are these like uh, when doing this thing? Because uh, when you're doing the GW, uh, I guess uh, we don't uh, consider these effects into, con so like how important are these effects in the band gap, uh, like correcting the band gap and the bands? Okay, many questions, but uh, I try to be synthetic. So you calculate in this uh, Dyson equation representation, you can calculate the Green's function just by any approximation of the self-energy. Okay, because this uh, G0 is something that you can obtain directly from the single particle energies. All the exchange correlation effects beyond the single particle description are encoded in the self-energy. So, Anything that is related to interaction is in the self-energy. Any approximation to the self-energy can be used to calculate uh, the Green's function. How you do this in practice, you will see when you do, for instance, GW calculation in practice with, with Yambo. How this is important, uh, the effect of the self-energy is represented here on the spectral function. So you go from this single particle picture where you have sharp peaks to this richer description where you have peaks that are uh, broad and where you have additional features. Uh, how this is important for the band gap, I would say not only for the band gap, but for the band structure in general and uh, for uh, effects beyond the band structure that are satellites. An example is here for germanium. So instead of having a metallic material as in LDA or a very large gap as in artifact, you are in much better uh, agreement with the experiment. And the difference between GW and ArtiFoc is in the screening. So you have to calculate the electric function that is the screening. And you will do this in practice. So don't forget to come also in the next days to the school. Okay, so thank you again, Matteo.